Are we playing God with our genes? Gene editing and human enhancement number one from the years 1990 to 2000. What makes you think this kid is mine? Boy, those faces look similar. A gene is a unit of inheritance. Mommies and daddies give genes to their children. As you probably know, each cell in our body contains 46 chromosomes, 23 from mommy, 23 from daddy. Well, usually nature isn't always perfect in passing these on. A chromosome is a chain of nucleotides called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. A chain, like a long piece of string, and it's folded so that it looks like a double helix, figure eight, something like that. A gene is simply a geographical location on each one of those chains. So a gene could be, you know, 5,000, 25,000 base pairs long. And it's just a section on the DNA that codes for proteins. That is to say, it makes our bodies. The word genome refers to the total number of genes that you and I have in our cells. So you have a genome, I have a genome. They're slightly different, uh, to be sure. And that's why we look a little different. But we human beings share 90 plus percent, 99 plus percent of the genes, so our genomes are very similar, even though they're not identical. Nineteen ninety is an important year because that marked the beginning of the human genome project. Oh yes, our scientists and U.S. Congress were getting ready in their years prior. But once the legislation was passed and the funding allotted, the program began in 1990. The public program, that is, but it wasn't long, and a private program spun off. And the 1990s was like a horse race between the private and the public. Who's going to get to the finish line? The finish line consisted of winning on two counts. Number one, sequencing the DNA. It was estimated there would be about 3 billion DNA base pairs. And then the second goal, of course, was to identify and locate the genes. Did they make it? Yes, they did. The first director of the U.S. Public Genome Project was James Watson, Nobel Prize winning geneticist. He approved an application we submitted from the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences at the Graduate Theological Union to study the theological and ethical implications of the Human Genome Project. And here you can see Roger Shin, theologian and ethicist from Union Seminary, New York, Karen LaBox, then at Pacific School of Religion and Bioethicist, 
and we work from 1990 till about 1994 monitoring the genomic research itself and then drawing off implications for theological anthropology and social ethics. As I mentioned, the Genome Project split shortly after it began. James Watson got into an argument with this man in the lower left-hand corner, Craig Venter, because Venter, a grantee, was filing for patents on DNA sequences that he had discovered, and Watson believed he ought not do that. Raw genomic knowledge should not be patentable. They had a big argument. By the time the dust settled, Watson was gone and Venter was gone. <laughs> and Francis Collins there on the right-hand side took over uh, from Watson and became the director and shepherded the government-funded genome project until it was completed. Venter uh, then um, got private funding and entered into a horse race. Francis and Craig raced <laughs> to the year 2000 to see who would get the most data about DNA sequences and the human genome. And a fascinating meeting of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in February 2001, both Francis and Craig each got an evening public forum for sharing the results of the respective genome projects. It's done. <laughs> And the two projects came up with pretty much the same information, all of which was shared with the worldwide genomic community. Yeah, I was there. It was exciting. When James Watson initiated the Genome Project in the late 1980s, he estimated there would be 3 billion base pairs in the human DNA, and he also estimated there would be 100,000 genes located on those chains of DNA. When they were done, <laughs> they confirmed the first one. Yes, indeed, there were 3.2 billion nucleotides. Yep, right on the money. But, <laughs> but, there was not a hundred thousand genes. In fact, they debated. Francis thought he found 35,000 genes, and Craig thought he found 25,000 genes, and they weren't even sure what a gene was anymore. Well, part of it was that the earlier assumption back in 1990, was that each gene would code for a single protein. Francis, on that evening uh, of his address at the AAAS, said, well, there's a big surprise here. One gene can code for three or four different proteins, <laughs> and they have to rethink what their original assumptions were. Rethinking assumptions based upon new information, that's part of the excitement of the frontier of science, especially when it's moving as fast as the frontier of human genomics has been moving since 1990 down to the present day. Now, here is Craig Venter interviewed by the San Francisco Chronicle, and this little interchange between Venter and the reporter is just the tip of a really big iceberg, and we're going to be looking at that iceberg later. 
So the reporter asked, what? <laughs> Only 30,000 genes? I thought there were supposed to be 100,000. So uh, Craig Bender responds to the reporter, Genes can't possibly explain all of what makes us what we are, said Craig Venter. Then the reporter asks rhetorically, so how did we come to believe that our very soul is encoded in our DNA? The reporter thought that Venter thought the human soul is encoded in the DNA. Where did that come from? What does that mean? Well, fasten your seatbelt. There will be some twists and turns, and we're going to figure out exactly what that means. Let's add a sidebar to our story for a moment and just ask soul? In the DNA, what could that mean theologically? Well, let's go back to a conversation in the Islamic tradition. We'll start with Ibn Sena, known as Avicenna, who influenced St. Thomas Aquinas. Ibn Sena, kind of like Plato, thought of the soul as being quite independent of the body. The soul is not the form of the body, and so there's no imprint of the soul on the body, and the body does not imprint the soul. If we were to follow that tradition, there would be no interaction then between our DNA and our soul. Bioethically, you could proceed with re-engineering our genome, and we wouldn't have to worry about it affecting our soul or our relationship with God. There's another tradition, beginning with Al-Ghazali in Persia, and he was more of an Aristotelian in which the soul is the form of the body. Hylomorphism is the technical term there. And the soul's activity is engaged with the physical and social nexus. So if we were to follow the Al-Ghazali tradition, we might want to think of the soul and the DNA as being connected. In fact, we might even think of the DNA, if it's the soul incarnate is sacred, we might want to invoke the, the commandment, thou shalt not play God, leave that soul alone. So when the reporter asked Craig Venter, well, wait a minute, I thought the soul and the DNA were interconnected and that we should expect a far more complex DNA configuration with 100,000 genes. What's this lousy, stinking 30,000 gene stuff about? Well, let's return now to our story and ask, this, or ask ourselves the question, what do scientists think today is the number of genes in the human genome? What do genomists today think about the number of coding genes in the human genome? 21,306. Well, that's pretty precise. How about that number will change gradually over time? We think it has something to do with your genome. With regard to the role that we played here in Berkeley within the larger Human Genome Project, here are some of our publications. Uh, Genetics Issues of Social Justice is an anthology 
that includes chapters by a number of the members of our own CTNS uh, research uh, team. Uh, For the Love of Children is a book that I author, Genetic Genetic Technology and the Future of uh, the Family, that deals primarily with reproductive uh, processes, especially uh, artificial reproductive processes and the bringing of children into the world with perhaps selected genomes. And is there a worry that we might commodify our future children through genetic technology? Playing God, um, that was a big topic during the 1990s. It led to the uh, blockbuster movie Jurassic Park. Everyone was talking about genetic determinism and playing God. And Francis Collins, uh, he and I were working together, of course, on the Genome Project. So Francis wrote the foreword for uh, my authored book, Playing God. That's the kind of mischief we got into in the 1990s and just the turn of the new millennium. Meet Mary Claire King. Mary Claire was not officially a member of our CTNS uh, Genome Project uh, research team, but she was a good friend. She consulted with us, and her own uh, laboratory was uh, right across uh, the street from the GTU on the University of California at Berkeley campus. And Mary Claire is what you might call a gene hunter. And during that period, she was hunting for the gene that she believed causes or predisposes a woman to inherited breast cancer. Here in Mary Claire's laboratory is her map of chromosome 17. She has hot and cold running graduate students doing experiments trying to locate the genes on chromosome 17. She says, Ted, you see that gene right there, VAT? That is a gene that you and I as human beings share with the electric eel. I said, uh, Mary Claire, I hope it's the gene that is responsible for when you and I walk across the carpet and shake hands, there's a spark. She says, well, I'm not actually testing to see what the gene does because I'm on a hunt. I'm on a hunt for the gene for inherited breast cancer. And she says, I think it's located right there. Well, Mary Claire was accustomed to sharing her data with other genetic researchers around the world on the computer. And using that data, some geneticists at the University of Utah found the gene before Mary Claire did. And they invited Mary Claire to give it a name. So she gave it the name BRCA. It's number one because a second gene was found later on on uh, chromosome uh, 11. So I commented to Mary Claire, BRCA. Now, some people might think that's breast and cancer. But the way I read it, it's Berkeley, California. And she laughed. She said, that is not an accident. (laughs) Now suppose you are born with the malfunctioning gene BRCA1 on your 17th chromosome. Are you predetermined to contract breast cancer? Well, that is not the term 
geneticists use. Rather, they say you would be predisposed. Women born with this gene may contract inherited breast cancer and die at age 35, or more frequently at age 65. And if you die at age 60, no one would ever even know you have that gene. If your oncologist discovers that you have BRCA1, <clears throat> he or she can prescribe uh, preventative um, action and also monitor any outbreak of cancer and provide uh, protective therapy. Well, that monitoring and therapy costs money, right? Does your insurance company want to pay that money? So a genetic predisposition to a disease is a pre-existing condition and the first and most important ethical issue that occupied genomics and geneticists in the 1990s was discrimination. The key question is how best to prevent genetic discrimination in health insurance and employment? Would insurance companies want to deny coverage to someone who is born with a genetic predisposition to a disease, that is to say, <clears throat> born with a gene that could become expensive or not. And because in the U.S., uh, health insurance and employment are connected, one could imagine getting turned down for a job on the grounds of one's genes. Some ethicists argued for privacy, that is to say, to make one's genome private so that insurance companies could not look at it. In my own judgment, this is an unworkable uh, solution to the problem uh, because genetic knowledge is computer knowledge and computer knowledge is going to be available to anybody uh, who has a teenager with hacking capacity. My recommendation is genetic information without discrimination. That is to say, we want our genomes known by our medical doctors so they can plan prophylactic uh, patterns uh, to take care of us during the years. This issue has not yet to date been resolved. Could genetic testing and genetic screening influence the current practice of abortion? You betcha. With a routine prenatal diagnosis, one could imagine a pregnancy with a future child having BRCA1. That's an expensive gene. Should we abort? There may be 4,000 monogenic diseases like BRCA1. If one of those monogenic diseases shows up in a prenatal diagnosis, should we abort or not? Will our health insurance company compel us to abort under threat of losing coverage? Down syndrome, called mongoloidism when I was a kid, is due to trisomy, three copies of chromosome 21, easy to spot in a prenatal diagnosis. And the population of Down syndrome people has dropped dramatically. So also with boys who are XYY. 
they routinely get aborted. From a Darwinian point of view, this probably increases the health and strength of the human race, but from a human rights point of view, it gives us nightmares. We will turn now briefly to the interpretation of genetics by the public theologian. I think of public theology as conceived in the church, reflected on in the academy, but addressed to the wider culture. I cut the public theology pie into five slices, the pastoral, the apologetic, the political, and the prophetic, and number five, the scientific. Science is embedded in society, and society is embedded in culture. And if the public theologian has a theology of culture, well, then we can reveal most interesting things sitting right before our very eyes. The public theologian should be a theologian of culture, understanding culture as Paul Tillich did. Religion is the substance of culture, and culture is the form of religion. Science is embedded in culture. Genetic science is embedded in culture. Is it possible for the concept of the human gene or the concept of DNA to take on religious valence? The answer is yes. In the late 1980s, when we were getting ready for the Genome Project to begin in 1990, geneticists started touting that DNA is the blueprint of what makes us human. Some even said finding the human genome would be like finding the Holy Grail. So what's happening here? How is DNA picking up religious meaning? Take a look at this cover of Time magazine. You see Adam and Eve, on the one hand, identified with nature, the trees. On the other hand, DNA in gold. DNA, science's holy grail. Here are Francis Crick and James Watson in 1953. Yes, this is the same James Watson who would later come to direct the Public Human Genome Project in the United States. In 1953, they discovered the double helix structure of DNA. DNA is just folded upon itself, but if you stretch it out, it looks like a long piece of string. Here are Crick and Watson years later after winning the Nobel Prize for their research both have passed away. So Watson and Crick discover the double helix structure of DNA in 1953. Now we're 1963. Salvador Dali, the artist, gives us a painting called Homage to Crick and Watson. What's going on here? DNA is entering the cosmos from the left, passing through Gala, <clears throat> that's um, Dolly's girlfriend, 
and then winding its way up into the heavens. Not only is DNA the essence of human life, it's becoming apotheosisized. Perhaps divine in origin, definitely divine in destiny. And even Francis Collins later wrote a book called the language of God. He thinks that DNA is the language of God. So what have we got going on here? It's an essentialism of sorts. DNA is picking up profound religious valence. So what is happening with DNA? Here's Richard Lewontin, a Marxist materialist geneticist at Harvard. Molecular biology, that's to say genetics, molecular biology is now a religion, and molecular biologists are its prophets. Will Lewontin convert to this new religion? No way. But he observes that it's a new religious movement. I like to use the word myth when we find a cultural trope or an intellectual model that influences the way we organize our data and think about reality. And in the 1990s, much more than today, uh, the notion of genetic determinism was quite influential. But I wanted to parse just what determinism means, and I think there are three dimensions to it. The first is puppet determinism, that is to say the genes determine our phenotype and our behavior uh, like a puppeteer pulling the strings on a puppet. The second is a different form of determinism. Uh, I call it Promethean determinism, and that is to say, if our geneticists, molecular biologists, can get into our DNA with our wrenches and screwdrivers, they can redesign the human essence and thereby determine the future. Then number three, thou shalt not play God, is actually a commandment against the Promethean determinists uh, without anything to say about the puppet determinists. Let me expand on this just briefly so that if there are religious dimensions in culture of DNA and genetics, that we can sort them out with a little, uh, with some degree of clarity. Here's a geneticist, John Avies. He represents the puppet determinist point of view. Genes mastermind our lives, influencing our physical appearance, health, behavior, even our fears and aspirations. We are ruled by genetic gods. Puppet determinism. During one of our genome meetings in Berkeley, we had a lunch break. I went to get a sandwich and saw this on the newsstand. I bought it. Life magazine, were you born that way? Personality, temperament, even life choices. New studies show it's mostly in your genes. Look, aggression, <laughs> obesity, optimism. So I bought the magazine, went back to our meeting, and Mary Claire King was sitting there, and I plopped it down in front of her, and I said, Mary Claire, is this magazine accurate? The genes determine all these things? And she laughed. She says, no, of course not. A special mind and body issue of Time Magazine, The Science of Happiness. 
why optimists live longer is joy in your genes. Our IQ, our intelligence, we're born with it. The genes determine it, really. What about our disposition to morality? Is that genetically determined as well? The Smithsonian, born to be bad? Is there a gene for sin? Did the theologians of the Middle Ages, thinking that we were born with original sin or inherited sin, were they right? Is that getting confirmed now by molecular biology? And if you and I do have the gene for sin, are we so condemned to be a sinner that we can't freely help ourselves? What about altruism? What about virtue? What about compassion and kindness? Is that genetically determined as well? Over the long evolutionary history of Homo sapiens, did evolution select, select genes for altruism? And are evolutionarily advanced babies born with just the right genes? There's no point in arguing with him. He can't help believing in free will. When we ponder the interaction between determinism and human freedom, we get stuck in all kinds of conundra. Philip Hefner, the theologian at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, says that evolution determined that we would be free. What might belief in the gene myth the belief in puppet determinism do for social class and race. 1995, Hernstein and Murray think IQ is found in the genes, and then they rank the lesser intelligent and the more intelligent races. Note whom they put on the bottom, African Americans and Latinos. We know they're not very smart, say Herstein and Murray, because they don't do very well in IQ tests. Seems as though cultural factors are ruled out. Well, then your garden variety white person uh, is smarter than the Latinos and Blacks, but the Asians are clearly smarter than the Whites. And the smartest race of all, if it's a race at all, <laughs> Ashkenazi Jews. Yeah. Well, what are the implications of this so-called uh, eugenic science uh, the implications are that society should support the cognitive elite because smart people contribute more to society than less smart people. And, of course, federal funds should not be given to children who are African-American Latinos because that's a poor investment. Rather, they should be given to the more intelligent groups in society. What we have here is the gene myth, belief in puppet determinism, now scientized, data are rallied in order to support a class structure. 
This gives bioethicists nightmares. If you think that your genome determines what race you belong to, fake news. Here's an article on racism in medical testing, but the author feels a necessity to straighten out a widespread misleading idea. Just take a look at uh, the red text there. This misleading idea persists despite ample evidence that race, a social construct, is not a reliable proxy for genetics. Every racial group contains a lot of diversity in its genes. Human genome researchers in the 1990s, such as Francis Collins and Mary Claire King and others, were very concerned that genomic data could be misused to foster racial prejudice. They believed, and still do, that race is not determined by the genome. That is to say, the differences between the races is smaller than the difference between uh, individuals. And so these are the kinds of bioethical questions which arose. Will the continuity of DNA dissolve differences based on the concept of race to see race as more of a social construct rather than a um, genetic construct? Will genetic testing be employed to determine inheritance rights? That's an issue that I find to be extremely important. It's my own belief that a Christian understanding of the family would deny inheritance rights based upon genetics. Families are determined by love, and adopted children are just as much members of families as those who have genetic continuity. This will be extremely important in Islamic communities where genetic inheritance dominates. Will genetic testing be employed to determine inheritance rights? Well, I think it already is. Will genetic testing indirectly scientize racial differences? That's what we saw in uh, the uh, Bell Curve book. And uh, this is uh, one that really um, uh, strikes terror into the hearts of the bioethicists. I find it helpful to distinguish three different approaches to genetics. So when you hear the word genetics, ask, well, who's using the term? The molecular biologists are the ones who actually do laboratory experiments on DNA and the human genome. So Mary Claire King and Francis Collins uh, our molecular biologists, the Human Genome Project, was one uh, in, in which molecular biologists were engaged. There's a second group uh, called uh, behavioral geneticists. We haven't uh, heard from them yet. The behavioral gen geneticists use statistics. And on the basis of statistics, they argue backwards that certain uh, behavioral um, forms uh, must be genetically derived. It's the behavioral geneticists that do the twin studies, uh, for example. Then a third category, sociobiology and its child evolutionary psychology, uh, do not do <laughs> research on uh, at the molecular level. 
uh, they do borrow some statistics, but for the most part, we have an ideology here which attempts to explain society, hence the name sociobiology, or psychology, hence the name evolutionary psychology, on the basis of puppet determinism. What we understand as society and culture has a genetic explanation. Now, when it comes to listening to the scientists and trying to gain genuine knowledge, I have to frankly say, I listen to the molecular biologists first. And if the behavior geneticists or sociobiologists have anything good to say, it's more by accident than design. That's my point of view. You don't need to adopt it. I'm concerned fundamentally about the relationship between molecular biology and culture. And behavioral genetics and sociobiology contribute to our cultural understanding whether or not they contribute anything to our scientific understanding. The evolutionary psychologists introduce a new factor in determinism. They are not strictly genetic determinists. They are also brain determinists. They argue that in the Stone Age, the human brain was selected for by evolutionary principles, and the human brain achieved a, letter of co a level of complexity beyond what the genome had attained. So now the evolutionary psychologist has a determinism that is largely brain determinism, even if the brain is the product of the genes. When I was a child growing up in Michigan, the debate over free will took the form of nature versus nurture. Nature is what we're born with. Today we would say it's our genome. And nurture would be our environment, whether the chemical environment influencing our cells or the way our mommies and daddies raise us or the schools that we attend or the video games that we play. Two-part determinism, puppet determinism in both nature and in uh, nurture. Where does human freedom come in? Well, when I was in college, Social determinism or environmental determinism was dominant with the Human Genome Project. It became reversed so that nature, our inherited genome, became the primary determiner. Well, where is human free will in all of this determinism? I'm an advocate of three-part determinism, nature, nurture, and the human self. is alcoholism in the genes. I can't help it if I'm an alcoholic. I've got the gene for it. Robert Cloninger, 1989, distinguishes type 1 from type 2 alcoholism. He's not the first, but in a research setting, he tells us that type 1 alcoholics are in the habit of having two beers with their dinner each evening, and after 40 years, they can't break the habit. It's type one. Type two. Type two, even as a young person, tends to go on alcoholic binges. Seems to be physically affected by alcohol. Sometimes engage in petty crime, and if they get married, they abuse their children. Nine out of ten are male, only one out of ten female. Could type 2 alcoholism be genetic? 
Robert Cloninger said, yes, he thought he found the gene for type 2 alcoholism on chromosome 21. It was never confirmed, but it was published. Well, let's leave Dr. Cloninger for a minute and go to California to a man named Mr. Baker and the court case, Baker versus California. Mr. Baker was an attorney, and he was accused of embezzling money from his clients. Now, every attorney you and I know, of course, is a, an individual of upstanding character, but Mr. Baker was an attorney who stole $300,000 or whatever figure from his clients. When he was brought before the California bar, he said he was innocent. Oh, yes, he stole the money, but it wasn't his fault. You see, he has the gene for alcoholism on chromosome 21. And he stole the money while under the influence of alcohol, therefore, his genes are guilty, and he is not. Well, <laughs> if you are evaluating this case, what do you think? Don't blame me. Blame my genes. Believe it or not, the court was persuaded, partially persuaded. Yes, Mr. Baker, said the court. <laughs> Your genes made you commit this crime. But now you know that you have the gene, and we expect that you will get control of your gene-determined behavior, and you will stop committing crimes. And if you come back into this courtroom with that defense, we'll find you guilty and throw the book at you. Think philosophically for a minute. Suppose there were a gene for type 2 alcoholism. Suppose he was influenced by that genetic predisposition to commit a crime. Should that accrue to his innocence or to his guilt? And then note what this court did. They thought they said, if you know you have the gene, it follows you have more moral responsibility than if you don't know. What do you think about that logic? Let's go over this logic one more time. Glenda Sue Caldwell lives in the Atlanta area. Glenda Sue Caldwell was arrested for murdering her son and attempting to murder her daughter. Her son was walking in the door, the front door, and Glenda Sue had a revolver in each hand. And with one, she shot her son twice and killed him. Then she went into the bedroom. Her daughter was just waking up from a nap. She shot the daughter in the head. But the daughter survived the surgery and was there in court with her mother when her mother was tried and found guilty of murder and attempted murder and sent to the state prison in Georgia. Five years later, the same judge who had given her the first sentence pulled her out of jail and back into court, had her retried and declared that she was innocent on the grounds that her genes made her do it. Why did the judge make that argument? 
in that period of time, uh, the gene on the end of chromosome 4, which disposes a person to Huntington's disease, was discovered and identified. Mrs. Caldwell suffers from Huntington's disease, and one of the symptoms can include moments of uncontrolled violent behavior. And it was during one of these moments of uncontrolled violent behavior in which Mrs. Caldwell shot her children. Therefore, she's innocent and sent her home. Now, she went back home to live with the older daughter, who had by this time forgiven her mother, and as far as I know, lived happily ever after. Let's think this logic through a little bit, okay? The gene for Huntington's disease is responsible for the attempted murder and the murder, not Mrs. Caldwell. A reporter for the Atlanta Constitution contacted the president of a national organization of people who suffer from Huntington's disease. There are 25,000 of, of patients with Huntington's disorder and asked what he would think about this case. So he didn't like the idea that the genes are responsible. Did the other 24,999 sufferers of Huntington's disease shoot their children? No, they didn't. If we were to believe that the gene for Huntington's is responsible for murdering children, then it would be prudent for us to arrest the other 24,999 before they commit the murder, right? Put them in jail. The point here is that genetic determinism could lead to a stigma. Even though 24,999 Huntington sufferers do not kill their children, they might get stigmatized if we develop a public doctrine that says genes make you kill your children. Genetic determinism. Moral responsibility, stigmatization, how do all of those things fit together? Liberal Protestants gave up on the doctrine of original sin uh, some years ago. But now, in the discussion over genetic determinism, it's back. <laughs> Evolutionary psychologists, recall, are determinists. For them, genes and brains together are the determiners. And the evolutionary psychologists believe they can explain human evil. Take a look at this Time magazine article. The Christian doctrine of original sin makes more sense as evolutionary psychologists learn more and more about why people do bad things. Should the theologians thank the evolutionary psychologists for confirming the doctrine of original sin? What do you think? First frame, we have a beating taking place. Wham, splat, ow! Hey, it wasn't me, it was my genes. Experts now say that most antisocial behavior, smoking, alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, even criminality, can be traced to faulty genes. It's important news. We're not responsible anymore. We're all victims. I heard too, brother. Oh my gosh, we're in this together? Wham, 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 wham. Infidelity might be in our genes. 
Oh my gosh, one spouse saying to another, but I had the strong impulse. <laughs> what about homosexuality? Could there be a gay gene? XYY males, as you're probably aware, when a girl is born, she typically has two X chromosomes, and when a boy is born, he typically has one X and one Y. Most of the genes are in the X chromosome, and the Y turns off some of the genes. The X can make both boys and girls, and the Y turns off the girl gene so that people like me become boys. Once in a while, it's anomalous, but once in a while, a boy is born XYY, and there was a spurious behavioral genetic study done in the mid-60s that suggested that the percentage of prisoners in prisons with XYY was disproportionate to the rest of the population, and a theory developed that boys who are XYY are more prone to lack of control and committing crime. Therefore, it's good to abort XYY children at the time of prenatal diagnosis rather than have them be born and go to prison. Well, the uh, scientific study was flawed. It was pointed out. It turns out that more accurate studies show that XYY boys are just like XY boys, and uh, there's no significant behavioral difference. However, the rumor hangs on, and I've had friends uh, with a pregnancy getting a prenatal diagnosis, having an XYY boy, and being told by their doctor they should abort based upon this fake scientific information. Genetic determinism. The gene myth, what Dorothy Nelkin calls genetic essentialism. It's a belief. It's a myth. And it influences our medical care. When we assembled our research group in uh, Berkeley in 1990, uh, Lyndon Eves, a behavioral geneticist on our research team with uh, quite a sarcastic sense of humor, said, well, you can tell the press that we're going to find the gay G. <laughs> well, a couple of years later, actually, there was a proposal that there would be a gay gene at location XQ. 28, actually it was a genetic marker that could be identified with some uh, gay men, and that has not been uh, roundly confirmed, but the idea that there are genetic factors in your and my sexual orientation certainly hangs on and deservedly so. Well, we had to wrestle with the possible implications of a genetic predisposition to sexual orientation, many gay people in the 1990s were making the public claim that they had always felt this way. That suggests a genetic origin. And if the gene myth, with all of its genetic determinist uh, corollaries, were to hold sway, what would that mean? Would the discovery of a gay gene provide a naturalistic argument for gay and lesbian rights? Could one say, look, I have the gene, therefore, in the public square, I deserve to have the right to express that gene. Would a naturalistic argument obviate codes based on spirit overcoming nature? We have that tradition of trying to convert people who feel they were born gay, convert them into heterosexuality and to use spiritual methods for that. 
would the existence of a gay gene suggest that spiritual conversion would be fruitless, maybe uh, maybe even a violation of rights? Would testing for the gay gene lead to anti-homosexual eugenics? So, if you could find that gene in prenatal diagnosis, just as we look for the Huntington's gene or we look for the BRCA1 gene, could we look for the gay gene and then abort rather than bring into the child into the world a child with a gay gene? Or conversely, what about the couples who want to have a gay marriage and gay family? Would they prefer the gay gene and abort those who don't have it? Well, these are the kinds of bioethical questions that um, we asked. Now, we brought in as a consultant a professor of law at Stanford Law School who argued against the gene myth, against genetic essentialism, on the grounds that the law should protect people's right to choose. You should have the right to choose whether you be heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, or transgender. You should have the right to choose. The law should protect that right. And the gene myth, the doctrine of genetic determinism, gets in the way of that choice. Let's just say the discovery of a gay gene would not in itself solve our moral questions, nor would it eliminate all by itself genetic discrimination. In an immediate response to the widespread discussion of the so-called gay gene on XQ28. The CTNS research group released a public statement arguing that genetics alone could not provide an ethical norm or a moral principle to be followed, that one would have to add theology, philosophy, or some other source of value And we did not want to see a genetic predisposition to homosexuality become a tool of discrimination. In our statement, we said we recognize that genetic diversity requires a response of love, respect, and justice. That brief statement can be found in an appendix to the book, Playing God. Let's pause for just a minute to talk about sex and gender, where the term sex tends to refer to our biologically inherited traits, gender, social identity. Our gender is a social construction. Now, let's see if that gets a little bit complicated when we look at alternative genetic combinations. As I mentioned earlier, the two sex chromosomes are X and Y. And if you look at our chart here, the typical biological female is has 46 chromosomes and two Xs. The typical biological male has 46 chromosomes, an X and a Y. And as I mentioned, All the hard work is done by the X chromosome. So all of us, boys or girls, are early on in our fetal development girls. Then the SRY gene and the Y chromosome kicks in to shut off some of the genes on the X, and then we begin to become a male. That's the standard operating procedure for the chromosomes. 
Now, some of us are born with only 45 chromosomes and one X. Uh, Turner syndrome is the term for that. And the person will be a woman, shorter in stature, and unable to conceive and have children. A 45X or a 46YY is going to have mixed gonadal dysgenesis. And uh, that's when the OBGYN confronts the baby with two sets of genitalia, and they typically operate to turn the child into a female. And in recent years, that common procedure has come under sharp criticism. Note the 47 chromosome XYY super male. I had uh, mentioned that earlier to say that it's fault science to believe that an XYY boy is a super male or more likely to go to prison uh, than the average XY. It's a debatable uh, issue. And as I had mentioned, 47 XYY boys tend to get aborted at prenatal diagnosis time. How about a 47XXY? That's a person with Klinefelter syndrome. It can be a man, low testosterone, uh, low st sterility, less hair, uh, weakness, etc. The point here is nature has more variety than our culturally conditioned binary thinking, boys versus girls affords. Here is some of the vocabulary that attends to this wider discussion. A transgender woman was born with mixed gonadal dysgenesis and the surgeon at the time turned that baby into a male, but she has identified through her life as a woman. A cisgender woman is one who is assigned a female gender at birth, uh, and she actually does continue to identify as a woman. A transgender man uh, at birth uh, with dysgenesis was assigned a female uh, gender, but he feels like a man, even though he's in a female body. A cisgender man was assigned maleness at birth, but he also identifies as a man. A non-binary person does not identify completely with either gender, may be fluid. As I hinted before, and now I'll summarize, I am not a strong adherent of the gene myth. I do not adhere to belief in genetic essentialism. And even though genes are strong disposers of both phenotype and behavior, they are not determiners in the puppet sense of the word. There's no doubt that genes and environment are two forces which determine your and my situation in life, but I do not believe that you and I can be reduced to either our genes or our environment or a combination. There is a third determiner, namely the human self. You and I as a human self can deliberate, we can make decisions, and we can take actions. I call that self-determination. It's also what I call human freedom, at least in the garden variety sense of liberty or freedom of choice. We are going to add now to puppet determinism a second form of determinism still within the gene myth, Promethean determinism. I will spare you the retelling of the Promethean myth, 
just be reminded that when we invoke the name of Prometheus, we are connoting an, an aggressive pursuit of difficult challenges in order to change the future. To be Promethean is to embrace technological can doism. And in the case of genetics, within the context of evolutionary thinking, by getting into the human genome with wrenches and screwdrivers, we can plan the genome of future generations. We can take control of the evolutionary process. We can guide biology into the new future that we make. Is Prometheanism optimistic? You betcha. Does Prometheism have any problems? You betcha. Those who do not like the Promethean mindset issue a commandment. Thou shalt not play God. Thou shalt not play God is a commandment that puts the chains on Prometheus. If you may, may remember, Zeus chained Prometheus to the rock. Who's going to win? The Promethean can do us among us, or the thou shalt not play God commanders. Controlling our destinies, a genetic conference held at Notre Dame uh, University. Prometheus is known for his pride, the Greek word hubris, quite frequently untranslated means, in the words of Paul Tillich, the elevation of the self into the sphere of the divine. And because Prometheus in the myth wanted to storm Mount Olympus, Mount Olympus and the gods, hubris or pride is the trait that we remember. And pride goes just before a fall, says the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Frankenstein, according to Mary Shelley, the author is a modern Prometheus. And those two feed in then to Jurassic Park, where Promethean determinism combined with the injunction against playing God make the plot of Jurassic Park what it is. Out of pride, the Promethean is unable to control the destiny and chaos, at least in the form of the dinosaurs going wild and devouring human flesh. Chaos is the result of excessive hubris. Thou shalt not play God, says, don't make a Jurassic Park. Don't let chaos be let loose. Yes, the eugenics movement in England, the United States, and France, and especially during Hitler's Germany, sought to help out evolution through selective breeding. It appears that the new genetic technologies might make it possible, not yet, but in the near future, might make possible children to order the perfect child through genetic selection and genetic modification. Not just healthy, but enhanced height, strength, musical ability, intelligence. Mommies and daddies could pay for genetic services. We would not have eugenics in the dictatorial sense of the Third Reich, but rather free market eugenics selling, <laughs> selling the perfect baby to those who have the money to pay. And you see the justice issues coming down the pike?
This is my family during one slice of time when we had all these teenagers at home. My wife and I believed in adoption. Is it genetic continuity between parents and children that defines a family? Not in my judgment, no siree. It's love that makes a family a family, and love includes a commitment to be loyal until death do us part. Something like that. I am not satisfied with those judges in paternity suits who think that genetic continuity counts legally. I don't think so. Inheritance should go to those that are the result of choice. <laughs> Love, loyalty, support is a matter of choice. And all these genetic technologies are increasing the amount of choice that we have, membership in a family these days is a matter of choice. I don't think the genes dictate who's in a family and who isn't. One of my daughters, Elizabeth, took advantage of 23andMe, a direct customer genetic testing company and by comparing genomes she was able to locate her birth mother and birth father. She's delighted now that she has two families of origin. So I want to rewrite First John, God loves each of us regardless of our genetic makeup, and so should we. That's the theme of this book, For the Love of Children, Genetic Technology and the Future of the Family. There will be so many different ways to bring children into the world in the future, and with increased capacities in genetic modification, the chances of having a child in discontinuity with the genes of the parents is only going to increase. Our ethical mandate to love and love unconditionally until death was part, that's what will define a parent to a child. This is my granddaughter. Kayla, adopted from an orphanage in Seoul, Korea. Now, Kayla makes loving children really easy. Gene editing and human enhancement. Why is human enhancement so important? Let's distinguish between therapy and enhancement and use the Definitions given us by Arvin Gao, whom we will meet later. Genetic therapy refers to the manipulations of the genome to treat individuals or their progeny with known diseases, disabilities, or impairments to restore them to a normal state of health. Therapy leads to what is normal. Enhancement refers to the use of genetic alteration, pharmaceuticals, devices, or other means to alter the normal workings of the human body or psyche or to be better than what is normal and native to healthy physiology. Enhancement goes beyond what is normal, what is beyond what is healthy. This distinction has become the place where most have drawn the red line. By most here, we mean the bioethicists. Enhancing 
the human. Psychopharmacology, drugs, one way to make us what? Smarter, more aware, or to give us mystical experiences. Now we're going to be talking about genetic enhancement, altering the human genome in order to make one individual superior to the others. Eventually, we'll deal with intelligence amplification, that's deep brain implants of a nano-bio nature, linking the human brain with the computer in order to have greater access to information and, depending upon your theory, maybe enhancing human intelligence. And that leads to great movements such as transhumanism, which leads us on the way to a post-humanist species so enhanced that our progeny will no longer be human. They will be post-human. Get ready for a rough ride. Fasten that seatbelt. Big turns, big twists, ups and downs. Will the Prometheans among us be satisfied with genetic therapy for those of us who are sick, or will they want to influence the germline, influence human inheritable genetic futures through modifying the germline, the gametes, those genes that will be passed on to the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. What has happened in the last decade is the advent of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. That is to say, what could only be dreamt of in the 1990s has 20 years later become an almost everyday activity. Today's Prometheans and Thou Shalt Not Play God Commanders have a face-off. Do we modify the human genome and influence future generations or not? Big ethical question. The consensus among today's molecular biologists and bioethicists is no, <laughs> don't play God, don't modify the human germline, not because the gene is sacred, no, but for another reason, namely, we cannot anticipate unforeseen effects. If genes operate with one another in systems, and if we modify a gene in such a way that that system fails to function, we might not realize this until a generation or two down the line. And so most geneticists and bioethicists are arguing, let's wait. <laughs> Let's be cautious. I call this the yellow light caution. Let's wait until we know more before we modify the human genome. The moral maxim, thou shalt not play God, is stronger than a yellow light of caution. No, it's a red light that says stop. And the reason it says stop is that the gene myth suggests without saying so that the gene is sacred. After all, the progenitors of the Human Genome Project described the human genome as the blueprint of what makes us human, as the holy grail of science, 
as genetic essentialism. So if our soul, as the reporter interviewing Craig Venter thought, if our soul is connected with our genome, then maybe we should keep our hands off of it out of reverence for the sacrality or the sacredness of the genome. What do you think? Should we play God like Prometheus and direct the future evolution of the human race? Or should we refrain on the grounds that there's something sacred about the nature that we have inherited? Theological anthropology. What is human nature? Was human nature fixed at the very beginning when God first breathed into the dust? Was it fixed at the beginning of the evolutionary process? No, the human genome has been changing constantly, perpetually for millennia, if not years numbered in the millions, the human species is not today what it was, even a few thousand years ago, and it will be different in the future. And the possibility of engineering, or at least partially engineering our changes, is something that gene editing makes possible. There is embedded in Christian theology a vision that the future human being will be different from the one in the Garden of Eden. You and I will become Christ-like. God raised Christ from the dead on the first Easter and promises to raise you and me at the advent of the kingdom of God. We will be transformed Oh, yes, we'll remember who we were in the old creation, but we will be citizens of the new creation in the kingdom of God. We owe the past no ontological loyalty. Here's John Zizioulis. The truth and the ontology of the person belong to the future, our images of the future. If our geneticists get into our DNA with our wrenches and screwdrivers and try to make a better person, could we think of that as an anticipation, a prolapsus, a partial, fragmentary to be sure, but as a prolapsus of God's future transformation? Well, if God is going to transform us, and if we are God's created co-creators, maybe we could do a little bit ourselves, as long as we have a vision of God's kingdom that is orienting the kinds of changes that we make. Please accept the apologies of this court. You're free to go now. And by the way, here's your DNA back. Oh, yes. DNA has made it into the courtroom. Let me offer a couple summarizing parting shots. We have described the gene myth in terms of determinism. When it comes to puppet determinism, The position I hold is the following. I believe in determinism. It's three-part determinism. We are determined by our genes, to be sure. We are determined by our environment, to be sure, both nature and nurture. Thirdly, there is such a thing as self-determination. As a self, you and I cannot be reduced to our genes. We cannot be reduced to our environmental influences. No. 
you and I every day, we think, we deliberate, and then we make decisions, and then we take actions, and that's what I call self-determination. It's not absolute, but it certainly makes a difference. Free will, self-determination, all within the context of gene environment determinism. With regard to playing God, uh, playing God tends to be a commandment wielded against our Promethean tendencies, our Promethean tendencies toward hubris, elevating ourselves into the sphere of the divine, taking on ambitious projects that, if they fail, result in chaos out of fear of genetic chaos, bioethicists tell Promethean geneticists to avoid playing God, and that's primarily avoid modifying the germline in such a way that we could lead to genetic chaos in future generations. Finally, and I didn't say too much about this, how should a bioethicist approach the research and medical dimensions of genetics? And I say with benef beneficence in mind, oriented toward the f answering the following question, how can genetic research accrue to the well-being, if not the flourishing, of humanity, as well as all those other creatures with whom we share our planetary home. Bye-bye.